Well, welcome to the screencast of Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. Uh, he's going to be our topic of study for the next uh, about week and a half, and so just kind of want to give you a big overview of him, his life, and the important impacts that he had um, on the presidency and the United States as a whole. Um, the first thing that we just need to talk about is he's the seventh president of the United States. Uh, he's elected in or starts serving in 1829 and then steps down eight years later having served uh, two terms as president of the United States. To kind of start talking about him, Andrew Jackson is poor. He's born in a log cabin um, and he actually enlists in the militia at the age of 13 and he fights in the Revolutionary War. Um, so he's kind of the last president to have any ties to the Revolutionary War because he did that at a young age. As I said, he's, uh, he's poor and uneducated, but he's driven. As you can see, not many 13-year-olds uh, enlisted and went and fought in a war. And so as he reaches the age of 18, 19, 20, he moves to Tennessee, and he becomes a lawyer despite the fact that he didn't have a lot of formal schooling. Uh, but he finds a guy, and in those days you didn't go to school to become a lawyer. You um, usually went and, and clerked or apprenticed for someone, and then eventually you were admitted to the bar. So he found someone, and he, he was uh, a successful lawyer in Tennessee, despite not having any formal education. Uh, one of the things that's really well known about Andrew Jackson, he was kind of a hothead, and he would... Uh, fight at the drop of a hat. He was well known for being outspoken, brash, and probably one of the most famous situations um, where this happened was when he fought a guy by the name of Dickinson in a duel over uh, horse racing. And I won't go into the details of it, but as you can see in this picture, Andrew Jackson here on the right was a tall, thin man, and he wore a large oversized coat on purpose because Dickinson, his opponent, was one of the best shots in the state of Tennessee. So Jackson knew that he probably would only get one shot, that, that Dickinson, there's no way he was going to shoot twice and, and not kill Jackson. So what Jackson did is they stood back to back, they marched off um, their paces, they turned, and Jackson let him uh, turn and fire first. But Jackson's hope was that he would either survive the first shot or that he would miss, and that's the reason he wore the large coat was so that he would it would look bigger than it really than he really was, and so the shot hit him in the chest, but it didn't hit anything important. It kind of just grazed the side. It did um, wind up staying in his chest and gave him problems for the rest of his life. Jackson then turned and shot Dickinson in the I believe in the abdomen, and he then. Uh, bled to death over the next couple hours. So it's a famous duel and Jackson fought several duels. He was well known for having been in several duels and killed uh, a few guys. Alright, so here's him saying, ouch, I'm hit, but you know, uh, I'll not miss you with my first shot. Okay, um, Jackson really comes to be well known through the um, War of 1812. He's an Indian fighter for the Tennessee militia at first. Uh, remember they had problems on the frontier with Indian uprisings and things. But towards the end of the war he finds himself down in New Orleans. He gathers a ragtag band of people from pirates to slaves to runaway slaves to the militias of Kentucky and Tennessee. And he fights against the British, against a guy who had actually just uh, been at Waterloo. Uh, not too long before, and he wins one of the most lopsided American victories ever. Um, again, it's only um, it's two weeks after the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812, but nobody in the battle knew that it had been signed. And this is, of course, a picture which doesn't really depict things well because Jackson's army uh, won a very lopsided, one-sided battle at the Battle of New Orleans, and as a result of it, he became a well-known um, person throughout the country. He also picked up the nickname Old Hickory during the war for being, you know, tough and hard as an old hickory tree. Uh, so he was well known for that. Uh, in 1824, the election of 1824, he runs against John Quincy Adams. Uh, they were both running to see who would be the sixth president of the United States. 
it's a very close race and, and it goes to the House of Representatives to vote and decide on who would be president. Neither side, neither person had a majority. And so what happens is John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay struck what's called the corrupt bargain. And so John Quincy Adams got Henry Clay to vote for him and to, since Henry Clay had a lot of uh, sway in those days. He got other people to vote for John Quincy Adams and then Henry Clay was made Secretary of State. And Secretary of State was seen as a stepping stone to the presidency. So Henry Clay very much wanted the presidency and so he said, yep, yeah, you make me, um, I'll vote for you. I get some other people to vote for you. You'll become president. You make me Secretary of State and then I'll become president one day. And so it was called the Corrupt Bargain by Jackson's followers. Uh, who reviled what had been done and hated John Quincy Adams and just lay in wait for four years to unelect him. And that's what happened. In 1828, Andrew Jackson becomes the president. He's the first Western person elected. So he was born, I think, in one of the Carolinas, but he moved to, to Tennessee and was well known as being from there. So he's the first guy from west of the Appalachians. And his election... <clears throat> because of his poor beginnings and because of who he represented shows a rise in the common man or the average American. There are four major issues in his presidency. One, the rise of the common man and his presidency is seen as the start of the modern Democratic Party. Number two, the bank war. Number three, the trail of tears. And number four, the nullification act and the force bill. The common man. Well, the first six presidents, they were kind of well-to-do guys. Um, many of them owned large plantations and things like that. Several of them were from Virginia, and except for the two Adamses, and they were they weren't super wealthy, but they they weren't poor either. The two Adams, uh, John and John Quincy. But Jackson's poor beginnings. He was super popular with the average American, and suffrage or the right to vote was expanding in the United States, and so uh, he because he had so much favor with with the people who were common the regular person in the old days it was usually that you had to own land or things like that to to vote but they expanded that to all white men of a certain age and so he was able to carry that vote and <clears throat> Jacksonians one of the things that his people thought was that those voting rights should be given to all white males regardless of whether they own land or not so that was a, a hallmark of his presidency the second thing that we need to know about Andrew Jackson is the bank war. And the bank war is Andrew Jackson versus the second bank of the United States. The first bank of the United States was the one that was started under Alexander Hamilton. It lasted for 20 years. At the end of it, they renewed the charter, and it was going on for another period of time. Well, Andrew Jackson hates the bank of the United States. He feels like it's too powerful. And in some ways, he's right about that. Um, it was a a government institution but also had private shareholders and and so it was a little bit of of truth to that and he felt it gave elite men too much influence and so he was quite angered by the Bank of the United States and so um, what he did is he killed the Bank of the United States. Uh, it came up for renewal of the charter they tried to renew it early he vetoed the renewal of the charter and you can see him trying to kill the beast here. So he vetoed the charter of the Second Bank of the United States, um, and then he withdrew the United States money from the Bank of the United States and put it in a lot of different banks in different states uh, that began to be called the pet banks. And so it was really, um, well, if you, <clears throat> if you got uh, money and you were in a pet bank, you liked it. But for most people, the common person, they liked that the bank was being killed. However, uh, the bank war destroyed the, um, well, it destroyed the economy. And the Panic of 1837 partially is caused by him killing the bank. Um, the Trail of Tears, you've probably heard about this before. So the Georgia Gold Rush is the start of this whole problem. Here's Georgia, and there's gold found in kind of the, the northwest corner of Georgia, and it sparks off one of the first American gold rushes. And the problem is that this area that the gold was found on here in northwest Georgia is actually Cherokee land. So it was owned by a Native American tribe, 
And what Georgia then be, tried to do was they tried to extend their laws onto the Cherokee lands and tried to, to steal and take some of the land from the Cherokee and let more gold seekers on there. Um, however, uh, the Cherokee sued Georgia in the case Worcester v. Georgia and the, the rule was, the ruling of the Supreme Court was, the Cherokee Indians are a separate nation and the laws of Georgia cannot be extended to their lands. The Cherokee being a separate nation, laws could, um, they could only make a treaty with the United States government. States cannot make treaties with foreign countries. So this is a quote from Andrew Jackson, John Marshall, the Supreme Court Chief Justice has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Build a fire under them, when it gets hot enough, they'll go. Andrew Jackson, 1832. So Andrew Jackson signs the Indian Removal Act, and by force he, he removes the Cherokee Indians along with some other tribes, which I'll show you in a second. It's called the Trail of Tears. Their removal is because of the number of deaths, and roughly one in four people died. So usually the very old and the very young were more susceptible or more likely to die on the journey to Oklahoma. So what the removal did is it took the Cherokee from these lands up here and it took them in winter through Nashville, Tennessee and then down into Oklahoma which at that time was called Indian Territory. And so this is the Trail of Tears because uh, roughly one in four um, people who went on it uh, died and so it was a very rough uh, thing also you can see here uh, he also removed the Chickasaw Choctaw Creek Seminole and the Sac and Fox um, all re removed them off of their native lands into lands in Oklahoma last thing is the Nullification Act um, the tariff of 1828 called the tariff of abominations in the south um, and the tariff of 1832, another protective tariff on imported goods, greatly angered the people of the South. John C. Calhoun was from South Carolina. He was Andrew Jackson's vice president, but this passage of these bills made him extremely angry. He resigned that, went back to being in the Senate, and then began to fight Jackson. And South Carolina, under you know, with John C. Calhoun working in here, he passed a law nullifying um, the tariff so the, the tariff of 1832 in the state of South Carolina so they said we're not going to collect it we're not going to enforce it and so Andrew Jackson said yes you are and John C Calhoun said well if you don't then we'll secede from the Union um, so there was some secession talk and then eventually there was a bill passed called the force bill which um, was basically that they were to call out federal troops and march them to South Carolina and force them to collect the tariff Henry Clay, the great compromiser, steps in and negotiates the compromise tariff of 1832 and both sides are uh, sufficiently happy to not secede and to not um, send troops down to South Carolina. So everybody kind of gets along. Jackson served two terms as president, remains one of the most influential presidents to hold office. He has a whole era named after him, the age of Jackson, sometimes called Jacksonian democracy. And the last thing I'd like to mention is that he did two things which uh, stand out. Uh, one is he didn't rely on his official cabinet. He relied on an informal group of advisors that were often called the kitchen cabinet because they came in the back door and met with him in the in the kitchen. And the second thing he did is he started something called the spoil system. So when he became president, he elected people who who maybe weren't the best at what they did, but they had supported him. And so he put those people into uh, different offices, whether a tax collector or, or different things like that. And that became called the spoil system. And so those are two other really important things that he did. The kitchen cabinet, that informal group of advisors, and then the spoil system, rewarding people that had supported him in his goal to become president. So I hope that helped you learn a little bit about Andrew Jackson. And um, yeah, bye-bye.